When you perform an alpha alkylation on a ketone that isn't symmetrical, two potential products can arise. And in fact, you could potentially even get more than that. Let's take this example. If I began with this uh, two methyl cyclohexanone, treated it with LDA, I would get potentially two different enolates. If the LDA stole a proton off of the right side of this cyclohexanone, then I would get the enolate shown here to the right. If the LDA stole the alpha proton off of the left side of this cyclohexanone, I would get the enolate to the left. If I then alkylated these two enolates, I would get potentially two different products. So it turns out this is a very real problem. Let's suppose that I'm in a position where I want to only generate one product, and I don't want multiple products. Is there any way I can do that? Well, as it turns out, we can react a carbonyl compound with an amine to form an enamine. We talked about that in the last chapter. Remember? Amigo or enemigo. Amine or enamine. The enamine can be alkylated and the resulting product hydrolyzed to give back the alkylated carbonyl compound. Here's how this works. If I take a carbonyl compound like this cyclohexanone and treat it with an amine, it generates an imine, which is not shown here. The imine can be treated with trace acid to then form this enamine. If I incubate this enamine with an alkyl halide, the electrons on the nitrogen thrust down, these pi electrons come out, form a bond with the alkyl group and give me this product. When this product is treated with acid and water, it then hydrolyzes and clips off the amine and gives me back my alkylated ketone. So why in the world is this so cool? Well, as it turns out, direct alkylation of a carbonyl compound gives several different products. In other words, if I started with this cyclopentanone, I treated it with base and alkyl halide, I would get a mixture of multiple different products. One that is, uh, has been monoalkylated, one that's been dialkylated on both sides, one that's been dialkylated at, on the same site, and one where I've gotten alkylation to occur at the oxygen. I probably don't want that in real life. Let's say I want just one product. What I can do is go back to the previous principle taught on this slide. If I take my cyclo hexanone or cyclopentanone, treat it with an amine to form an enamine and then alkylate that directly. As it turns out, the enamine alkylation only produces the monoalkylated product alone. That's it. So that's the way of being able to take ketone and selectively alkylate only once. Enamine's usefulness isn't limited to just alkylation, however. You can also acylate enamines like this. I take my cyclohexanone, treat it with my amine, trace acid to convert it to this enamine. And here, instead of converting or treating it with an alkyl halide, I'm going to tr treat it with an acyl chloride. Electrons from the nitrogen come out or come down. These electrons come out. Electrons go up. Tetrahedral intermediate thrusts the electrons back down, kicks off the chloride, and gives me this product. I hit that with aqueous acid, it then yields this ketone product that has been acylated instead of alkylated. So let's pretend that I'm an organic chemist who doesn't want to place an alkyl group on the alpha position. I'm tired of alkylating at the alpha, alpha position. I want to alkylate at the beta position. Can I do something about it? Well, as it turns out, you can put an alkyl group on the beta carbon by doing a 1,4 addition also called a Michael addition or a conjugate addition, which we talked about in chapter 18 and also mentioned a few slides ago. Here's how it works. I have to begin with a ketone or an aldehyde or some species like this that has a double bond adjacent to the carbonyl carbon. This type of species is called an alpha-beta unsaturated ketone or aldehyde. If I treat this with a nucleophile, the nucleophile could go in at one of two places. It can either go into the carbonyl carbon, that's called the direct or 1-2 addition product, or it could actually go into the beta position. If it goes into the beta position, it gives me the conjugate or 1-4 addition product. Here's some cool examples of Michael additions. 
I, let's say I begin with this alpha beta unsaturated key, or aldehyde, and I react this beta diester with a base. The base strips off this proton, gives me a negative charge at this carbon, and that negative charge comes in at the beta position. After this double bond gets protonated, this is my final product, the 1,4 addition product. Similarly, if I take this alpha beta unsaturated ketone and react it with this diketone, the base can strip this alpha hydrogen, give me a negative charge at this carbon, and that negatively charged carbon could then come in at the beta position right here. These electrons come up, they get protonated, and it ultimately results in this 1,4 addition product. What in the world is the mechanism? Well, I alluded to it before, and here it is shown in actual drawing form. I'm not going to narrate this uh, slide, but I'll let you look at it for yourself instead. Conjugate additions can also be done using enamines. This type of reaction is called the Stork enamine reaction, named after a Columbia University chemist named Gilbert Stork. I have a humorous but controversial personal anecdote to tell you about this reaction, but that will have to wait for class, since I don't dare do it on a video that's going to be accessible through the internet. In summary, if I take my ketone and treat it with an amine, I can convert that into an enamine. This enamine can then be stirred with an unsaturated aldehyde or ketone. The electrons on the nitrogen come down. These pi electrons come out, forming a bond with the beta carbon to give me this intermediate. When, this in, when the electrons and the oxygen come down and protonation occurs at this carbon right here, I ultimately end up with this product. I can then clip off and hydrolyze this uh, aminium species by treating it with aqueous acid, giving me back this ketone product.